I know all of you out there have watched enough crime shows. You know that those crime scene investigators have some interesting biological tools in order to help them uh, estimate how long a body has been, shall we say, there out in the elements, right? Certain things happen in the decay process including a whole bunch of different organisms that come to a body at different time periods in order to take advantage of the resources that are available. All right, that's all very gruesome, but we're going to take some of these very interesting forensic tools and we're going to apply them to fossils. Yeah, and that's going to help us come up with a really interesting criticism of flood geology. That's right. Greetings, true seekers. Dr. Duff here, your friendly biology professor and theistic critic of pseudoscience. Today, yes, we've got another episode of flood geology failures. So let's talk dino bones, dermistids, and decay coming up next. Okay, here we are. We're at the Journal of South American Sciences for this episode of Flood Geology Failures uh, from an issue in 2018. We've got insect damage and dinosaur bones from the Cerro de Pueblo formation from the late Cretaceous uh, in a site in Mexico. And let's see, we got our authors, uh, Claudia Branas from Mexico. We've got uh, Belinda Chavez from the Smithsonian Institute and Augusta McCracken from the University of Maryland. And these three have teamed up to bring us uh, some interesting uh, observations from hadrosaur bones uh, found in Mexico. And so what does this have to do with a global flood? Well, of course, you know, young earth creationists believe that uh, all of the dinosaur bones found in the fossil record all are the result of a chaotic uh, global flood just 4,350 years ago at the time of Noah, in which case all the dinosaurs, except the pairs of dinosaurs that were on the ark uh, were laid down in the geological column. And so this was a, the important thing to remember here is this would have been a very cataclysmic, very short-term event. In other words, several weeks to maybe a couple months in total time for completely bearing the uh, geological column and all these different dinosaur bones in it. So that brings us to this forensic thing, looking at insect damage in dinosaur bones. Hmm, what, what caught my eye with this? What caught my eye was, all right, if there's a bunch of dinosaurs wandering around um, prior to the onset of a global chaotic flood, and then all of a sudden the deeps break forth, the uh, water spirits out, the fountains of heaven come down, and you have the water covering the earth, and the dissolution of a lot of the sediments of the rocks, uh, of, the, of the sediments that are present prior to the flood, all of a sudden all become in that water and all the dinosaurs are swept up in that. Um, where does this insect damage come from? Because what we're talking about here is we're talking about dinosaur bones that have been found fossilized, but in the dinosaur bones themselves are obvious evidence of excavations by insects that have been eating away at those bones. And they would have been eaten away at the bones prior to their fossil, prior to them being fossilized because they're, they're not going to eat rock, all right? They're eating bone, presumably because of the nutrient material uh, in that bone. And so let's just, uh, let's dig into it. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of the insect damage, and then we'll get right down to their, um, well, let's get right down to their discussion. This study represents the first description and analysis of insect borings on hadrosaur bones. Uh, now, this isn't the first insect damage find on dinosaur bones altogether. This is just the first evidence of insect damage on hadrosaur bones. Here we describe seven different trace patterns that include a new species and possibly termite damage. All right, so seven different patterns, what they're talking about is seven different kinds of damage to the bones, possibly caused by multiple different stages of the same insects, right, at different lifestyle stages or life cycle stages, or potentially different species of uh, insects causing damage. So termites plus a bunch of other things we're going to find it. Main one being dermistead beetles, or a bird, beetle larvae. I think here. Comparisons of these trace morphologies with extant necrophagous all right, insect groups suggest that the CDP borings were likely the result of dermistead beetle larva and possibly termite uh, on the dry hadrosaur corpse prior to burial. Hmm, now ah, you can see why my interest in 
using this as a flood geology failure episode. All right, so as I said before, you know, most of the dinosaur, most of the perception of young earth creations is that there would be flocks of flocks, herds of dinosaurs wandering around on the land, right, across the uh, pre-flood world. Uh, and then you have the initiation of the flood. They're caught up, they're running away. Some of them are jumping on vegetation mats and some of them may survive for a while, but nonetheless, they come to die and their bones end up fossilized in the geological column that's produced during this short-term dramatic event. Now, wait a second. If all these uh, dinosaur bones were captured and put into place within a few days, maybe a few weeks, possibly a month or two, but the ones that were took a couple months to get preserved would be ones that maybe are dinosaurs that survived for the first month or two of the uh, of the flood event and so we're like hanging on to debris and then as there were little bits of land present maybe they jumped off the debris and ran around i mean this is this these are actual descriptions that young earth creationists have of like how the dinosaurs could have possibly survive for a while. And remember, they need them to survive for a reason that we talked about in a previous flood geology failure, which is there are millions of dinosaur footprints in the fossil record. So, you know, there had to be some alive running around somewhere in as these layers of sediment were being laid down so that we could capture their footprints, right? That, that alone is a, is a tremendous challenge to young earth creationists and their flood geology model. But what, now what I'm getting at here is that insect damage and you see here, when I talk about necrophages insect groups, these are groups of insects that are specialist on decay, all right, organisms that have died, and they are uh, working on the decay process, right? And not only that, the last part of this says that are on the dry hadrosaur corpse. There are insects that come, there, there are organisms that eat fresh tissue, right? Like you got your... Uh, um, you got your vultures, you have your hyenas, you have a whole bunch of different animals that will eat the flesh of an organism that has recently died. Uh, and then you might have organisms that actually chew on some bones to try to get bone marrow out of them. But nonetheless, then there's going to be sort of the hide, which is too tough for most organisms to eat, for large carnivores to eat. But now what we've got is we have a situation where we have um, necrophages insect groups insect groups that are specialist on decaying organisms dead remains and not just remains of like fresh tissue these are remains of organisms that their bones have uh, what what's all that's left are the bones and it's usually dry material dry bones and then maybe dry hide all right the really thick uh, epidermal tissue of some animals and hair all right and teeth and things like that What's going to eat that? Those are sort of the late comers to the party, right? And, then, and they then will slowly work away at uh, dissolving and eating away those other tissues. In fact, they even lay their eggs inside the bones, all right? And then the larvae will hatch and they'll have something to eat on top of that. This is a rather lengthy process. This is done something that just happens over a day or two. Let's just get all the cards right out on the table here. We're talking about the evidence. The evidence is presented in this paper for a process that is ongoing for multiple weeks, if not possibly a couple months, in order to get these bones to the condition that they are then finally preserved in the fossil record. Whereas they have to have undergone a considerable amount of decay. And then these beetles have to have chawed on the bones and then dug into the bones and laid their larva all right, laid their eggs inside these bones and the larva hatched. And then that larva began to eat uh, inside these bones in order to make the kinds of markings that they're seeing on these hadrosaur bones. That suggests an organism that's died and has been dead for a long time. And then you have to have, the insects have to be able to find this carcass in a global flood. Well, it's completely, you know, swamped, all right? Completely covered with water. Where are these beetles coming from? How are they attracted to coming to this particular site? Different beetles, different organisms are attracted to a carcass based on the chemicals that the carcass gives off, right? It takes a while for those chemicals to waft off to some area. And then, and then these beetles that are presumably have survived on some other carcass somewhere else, 
will then realize, okay, we're, we're about done here. And the next generation of, well, they lay their, lar they lay their eggs, the larvae are growing, but they're running out of food and they're going to be attracted to the scent of another dead body and go find that. Now, sure, young earth creationists can say, well, there was a lot of dead bodies, right, in the, in the global flood, right? Billions and billions of them. Um, but they're not laying around on the surface and they're not decaying to the point where there's only bones left. And then beetles congregate on these while the water is sloshing around and they're being preserved underneath the sand. Hmm. This is, this is a big problem. Well, let's just take, let's take a look at a couple of pictures here. Um, this is the upper Cretaceous period. So they're just showing some examples of holes in this case, notches, different kinds of chambers. And these are all typical changer, chambers seen and typical things that are seen in bones like, you know, of, uh, you know, wildebeest that dies in Africa. And then several weeks later, right, after all the hyenas and everybody is the thing, and then there's the bones just strewn out there and they're dry. Even those dry bones can be a food source for some animals, including these very tough beetles. Um, here's a list of a bunch of different bones from hadrosaurus all in one area. So these are different, actually probably from multiple different hadrosaurs. Uh, in some cases, maybe multiple bones from the same hadrosaur. And they think that in this case, most of these are called by dermistead beetles. Um, there's evidence in the fossil record of dermistead beetles, uh, preserved actual dermistead beetles that are preserved. Uh, so not just these what are called trace fossils because these are like the evidence of their behavior that's left behind not the actual beetle itself uh, so lots of pictures in this paper of various portions of bones in this case the vertebra of this organism has all these little pockets all over it and each one of these little indentations is where uh, where beetles have dug out um, and carved away uh, at the bone Prior to, in this case, what would have eventually happened to happen is later some sediment got put on top of these bones. They got preserved. So maybe they're dry bones sitting in a, in a dry uh, basin or, or dry riverbed for some period of time, like during the dry season. And then there are big storms. And then those bones that are just like, you know, the dry bones that are partially decayed right get dragged down and then all deposited in various bone beds uh and then they get under you know they get covered over by sediments and then eventually those possibly get preserved well in this case these did get preserved because we have them now today um in the geological setting part of this paper so our paper that talks about fossils is going to talk about the setting the location is found what other evidence do they have about what that location was like in the past and what they view this as is this is a low-lying, hilly area uh, with stream beds, um, very kind of light vegetation, and then kind of running into the sea that's not very far away. Uh, but this would have been kind of like a, a, a semi-arid landscape, which also had water because of the, the stream inputs uh, or river inputs. Um, and that's based on the texture of the sediments and the other types of fossils found in the same area. But let's get, let's just get right down to, I think you've pretty much got the point already. Let's just sort of home in on what they say here. Uh, identity of the track makers. Ah, I want to show you a figure and their final discussion, or their final points. So here, I just want to cover the, 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 the life cycle, right, of a bone, right? You've got a fresh carcass. It's bloating in the heat, all right, laying out in this uh, semi-arid area. You have dermistead beetles arrive. So that's because they make, that's because of the volatile, you know, aromatic compounds that are released, all right? Female dermistead beetles also arrive. Mating goes on, right? And they're feeding. So there's a big feeding aggregate. They're mating. Then you have, uh, you know, the, the whole thing is drying down more so. And then you have these holes and notches and furrows and various tunnels are being formed. And then you have the late dry stage where the, you have the pupation chambers, right? And then that's where the eggs have hatched. And now the pupa are growing because what they've done is they've placed their eggs in this nutrient-rich environment. 
Uh, and then when the pupa hatch, they have something to eat, right? And they continue to, to grow in there. And there, there's differences between like the chamber that's made just to implant a egg and then the difference between like how far you got. You know, sometimes you actually see the evidence that the pupa hatched and now it's growing and it's coming out. And eventually what happens is the adults merge. And by the time they emerge, there's not a whole lot of food, not a whole lot of resource at this particular location left. And when there's another animal that's dead and it begins to bloat and give off these volatile aromatic compounds, well, then that's going to be the signal for them to fly off now that they've matured in, and molted into the adult stage. They're going to take off and look for that next carcass. And the life cycle continues, right? Over and over and over again. So this kind of damage on dinosaur bones, which I said before, this is on hadrosaurs in this place in Mexico, but this type of evidence is also found on many, many other uh, dinosaur bones, suggests that this kind of life cycle uh, has existed for a very long period of time. And for young earth creationists, it means that this particular type of life cycle, these types of beetles, has existed since before the flood, because obviously these beetles had to be around in order to do this. Now, I would say that some of your earth creations might respond to this. They may say like, okay, that sounds like a big problem, but here's my solution. My solution is maybe these are bones of dinosaurs that died before the flood. And so exactly what you're describing is exactly what happened. This might've taken weeks, maybe months to do this entire cycle of the life cycle to get back to having the pupil stage and then or even getting back to adults again. Uh, and so this all happened prior to the flood. And so these were bones that were lying around before the flood from dinosaurs that had already died. And uh, this, these different life stages had happened. And then when the flood occurred, those bones simply got picked up off the surface, mixed into the sediments, and then they got laid down in the fossil record. And when we look at that fossil, we're not actually looking at an organism that was killed by the flood itself. We're actually looking at an organism that was killed by some other event prior to the flood. So I've heard this, um, this type of explanation been used for, for some uh, fossils because you know, it makes sense that there would be some carcasses around, right? Some bones from before the flood. These are a bunch of bones all found together with the same type of damage sort of at the same stage when they really find a, a, an animal that has multiple bones from the same animal. Um, and they all are kind of at the same stage. Well, that tells you that that is the stage at which it finally got covered. And the sort of this life stage thing stopped. Uh, you, the life cycle was stopped by some other natural event. You know, how likely would it be that uh, these bones would all end up together as hadrosaurs? If they were scattered bones before the flood and then you had this thousand foot of sediment laid down below, like many places have a thousand feet of sedimentary rock below them here. And then at some layer, specific layer here, we've got some hadrosaur bones. So they, you know, these hadrosaurs that were dead before the flood, their individual bones got picked up and somehow floating around in the water ended up all landing in this one, you know, localized area. And they all happen to have the same kind of insect damage. That's why we call this a flood geology failure or a big flood geology conundrum. All right, last thing. Um, here's their scenario, right? I think it's worth going through this. Here's their scenario. Male adult bills can reach a carcass in the post bloating stage, all right? Between five and 11 days post mortem. So after the organism dies, and this is a reptile or a bird or, you know, a, a mammal, right? This, this isn't, would be exclusive to dinosaurs, right? The observation is that these beetles, and there's hundreds of different species of these beetles and all that, you know, scattered across the various continents today. Um, you're talking five to 11 days just for them to arrive, right? Because that's, you have to have the release of these volatile aromatic compounds um, during the decomposition process. And then they're attracted to that and they're bring those there. Um, oh, and, and actually I forgot about this extra little layer of complexity kind of like the, uh, this is a nice little uh, cherry on the top here. The males are attracted by the volatile compounds. They get to this site, they start to feed, and then they're like, hey, we're ready to reproduce, right? I mean, we're only going to live so long. We got to reproduce. Then they give off a pheromone and that attracts the female beetles. 
So that's going to take a little extra time too, right? It's going to, this whole process takes a little bit of time, days of time. Once on the corpse, male and female be uh, beetles form mating aggregations, start feeding on the moist muscle tissue or oligomous tissue remains that were left by other necrophagous insects like blowflies and maggots and so forth, right? You got your things that get there right away, right? These dermistead beetles are usually are kind of late comers. They're, they're picking up the scraps of what's already been taken by a previous set of organisms. After oviposition and hatching of the eggs, which can reach a total of 800 leg, uh, laid eggs per adult female, the larva completely infest the remaining carcass and feed constantly on the dried skin and bones left by the adults during the early dry stage. In other words, 20 to 30 days. You see that? They're laying eggs here. Those eggs then hatch. And then you've got the larva, all right, completely infesting this particular organism. At this point, the majority of adult beetles have abandoned the cadaver and thus interspecific uh, inter competition between adults and larvae is avoided, right? So the adults are laying the eggs, tons of eggs there. They've done their mating. Uh, they don't go off to die right away. They can still potentially continue to find fresh victims and continue this process again. So they take off, right? The good easy material is, uh, is gone and they leave the rest to the larva, right? So they're not, that's what this whole idea of inter, um, you know, avoiding intercompetition between generations. The adults aren't taking away the, 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 their own offspring's food, right? So they take off, go find another uh, carcass to start the process again, and the larva get to enjoy the rest of the material. After this period, the final stage larvae start to slow in their nutrient consumption and begin to excavate a pupation site in the hardened substrate. All right, I misspoke earlier because I was talking about laying eggs and then the pupa forming. I forgot, you lay, are they laying eggs straight on the, on the surface? They're hatching, they're getting all these different larvae, they're eating away, and then they begin to bore into uh, the, uh, the bones themselves. So again, another indication that this isn't like you don't get this type of damage to bones just like right away. All right. This is going to be like, oh, animal's dead. And then a day later, you get these bones. Look, for one thing, the bones aren't even really going to be uh, accessible right, to a lot of other organisms until many, many days later. Um, all right. So anyway, um, where was I? Uh, during the late dry stage. Right? This is especially common when dermistead colony is large. Finally, the male and female dermistead adults emerge from the pupation stage. And of course, they're going to go off and start the whole cycle again. All right, so all of this, when you add it all up, we're talking 20 to 30 to up to, I've read uh, in dermistead beetles, that this could be like a 60-day process. And this would all have to occur before the bones are buried in order for them to become part of the fossil record. I don't know. I think that's about all there is to say about this one, right? This to me is just yet another in a long line. I've already done, I don't know, six or seven videos on what I call flood geology failures, or I guess you could call them flood geology challenges to young earth creationism. Um, these are just things that if you are, are looking in the literature and really thinking about the details of these things, you, uh, many young earth creation speakers simply just talk in very big, broad generalities about like there's billions of bones and Ken Hamill talk about like there's millions of dinosaur bones and they're all found in these fossil graveyards. They're all just swept up and piled there, right? Because a whole bunch of animals got swept up and they got covered up by, by, uh, uh, by sediments. But then when you start to look closely at the bones, you'll find many, many examples of things like this, which suggests that that simplistic story is just what I, just what it is, a simplistic story, an overly simple representation that isn't biologically realistic. Um, when you start to look at examples like this, this is just what we observe today. This is what we observe happening today not a, uh, a one-time unique event, but something that just is a, a natural cycle of life that we observe all around us all the time.
And that's what we're seeing represented to us in the fossil record. All right, that's it. That's um, hadrosaur bones with a whole bunch of insect boring uh, sites in them preserved for us in the fossil record. Uh, not your flashy, super sexy um, fossils, but very informative fossils nonetheless. That's it. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.